Hello and welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've practiced as a geotechnical engineer for nearly 18 years. And in addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I've focused on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. By STEAM, I mean science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I am thrilled to be talking with Dr. Sebastian Lobo Gallero, PE, a Geotechnical Engineering Project Manager and Laboratory Manager of American Geotech and Environmental Services, Incorporated. We're going to talk about all kinds of things as far as his career journey, his vision on what geotechnical engineers could do in life, and also a little bit about what it means to be an engineer that attends conferences. So really good stuff here. Now, before I tell you more about our guest, I would like to share with you some very exciting news. The Engineering Management Institute, the publisher of this podcast, has recently launched two brand new YouTube channels, How to Pass the PE Exam and How to Pass the FE Exam. These channels will be focused in on helping engineering professionals like yourself prepare for these career changing exams. Please check them out. And if you're currently preparing for these exams, these channels may include some great tips and tricks for your exam preparation. Links will be added to the show notes of this episode. And now I'd like to formally introduce you to our guest for today, Dr. Sebastian Lobo Gallero, PE. Sebastian Lobo Gallero, PhD, PE, is a geotechnical project manager and laboratory manager at American Geotechnical and Environmental Services in their Pittsburgh headquarters. Born in Colombia, South America, Sebastian received his BS in civil engineering at La Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. He completed his MS and PhD degrees in geotechnical engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. Sebastian has more than 18 years of experience in geotechnical engineering, specializing in the design of deep and shallow foundations, earth retaining structures and landslide stabilization. He is a former chair of the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, Pittsburgh Geo Institute, a former director of the Pittsburgh ASCE chapter and a current board member of the Deep Foundations Institute, DFI, Anchored Earth Retention Committee. He was the conference chair for DFI 45, the 2020 DFI Annual Conference. Sebastian has authored more than 70 papers and presentations included in different geotechnical journals, magazines, and conference proceedings worldwide. He's also a co-author of the geotechnical sections of the State of Delaware Bridge Design Manual. And with that, Let's get right into our conversation with Sebastian. Sebastian, welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. We are honored to have you. How are you feeling, man? Doing good, doing good. Thank you very much for the invitation. This means the world to me. I'm a fan, so it's great when I get the call. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, Sebastian, we introduced you earlier in the show, but in your own words, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what do you do on a daily basis? Yes. All right. So I'm a geotech engineer and, you know, I'm originally from Colombia, South America, end up coming to the States and we can think we're going to go into that in a a little bit. Uh, But basically, after I finished my PhD, I started working on a company that is called American Geotechnical and Environmental Services. We are located in Pittsburgh. We also have an office in Philadelphia, and we also have one in DC that is just starting. And we specialize on transportation geotechnics. So basically what we do is design and construction consultation for everything that is related to geotechnical on, you know, anything transportation related. So that would be bridges, a lot of foundation for bridges, spread footings, you know, friction piles, piles to rock, drill shafts, micro piles. Uh, and then we also do a lot of earth retaining structures, all kinds of walls, you know, field walls, cut walls, uh, soldier pattern lagging, MSC, T walls, you know, anything that you can imagine. Uh, but then the, I guess one of my favorite areas is really the third one, which is slope stabilization. So we do slope retrofits, landslide stabilization from, you know, anything from 
soil nails, rock nails, anchors, uh, even to integrate them with like a retaining structure. So we can do also like hybrid systems and things like that. That is really the main of, of what I do and what we do. I'm a, I'm a project manager at AJ Sync. I it's, it's a smaller company. We are about 70 people. So I say that I wear many, many hats. I guess technically I'm a senior engineer, project manager. I'm also taking care of the lab, so I'm the lab manager. So yeah, I guess my title has many, many like slashes and things like that, but I do love every single aspect of it. Um, it's great because it's exactly what I wanted to do when I got into into engineering, like into engineering in school. When I when I identified what geotech was about, I, I love the lab. I spent a lot of time in the lab, and you know I wanted to keep that part of my career. But I also wanted to design and 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 construct basically, you know, different structures and, and very very basic things. You know, going back to foundations, which is one of the areas that attract me and love stability and and things like that. So yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do on on a normal day. I, I do design. I mean, I guess as you move on your career, obviously, you move from being the guy doing the calls to be the guy checking the calls to be the guy writing the report and. Uh, I guess these days I don't really do much many calcs themselves, but I guide a lot. Uh, I review a lot of things. I do a lot of QA, QC, and and I really enjoy mentoring people. So I'm still heavily involved, probably more than I should, in computations and things like that. It's just because I I truly have a passion for for that, and I I love guiding people and see them masterize the fundamentals, I guess, of, of geotech engineering. Uh, and the other part is I I do a lot of design build too. So I try to spend time on the field. You know, which is it, it has been a passion of mine since I was a kid, and I guess we can talk a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. But I, I do love going to the field, and uh, if you, you know, if we are connected on LinkedIn or Facebook or something, you probably know that part by now because I post, you know, a lot of pictures every time that I go. There is nothing that brings more satisfaction than going to the field, seeing what I design being constructed, and be able to take a selfie and kind of claim it and. And you know, later, I'm sure later on in my career, I'm gonna look back and, and have great pride on everything. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I I, uh, I follow you on LinkedIn and I see the post. And honestly, if I wasn't a geotechnical engineer, I'd want to be one because of the stuff that you talk about. So Excellent. keep up the I, good work there, man. <laughs> I do appreciate that. I do appreciate that. That's awesome. So, man, if that's a typical day, it seems like no two days are the same. Sounds like you got a lot that yeah, you're responsible no, yeah, for. No. <laughs> yes, I, I think, unfortunately, with the pandemic, obviously, things have changed a little bit, but but it's okay. I mean, I think what we do is still, you know, field-wise, it's still at a point that we can go and do construction and, and things like that, and, 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 and it's good. I can complain. I mean, I, I do have a very nice, rewarding profession that, even in hard times like this, are still allow me to do a lot of the stuff that I love. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we, we've seen that during this time, you know, there might have been a slowdown, but we're still pretty busy. You know, we're blessed for that. Correct. And, and that's good. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, cool. So you said that before you came to the U.S., you, you're from Colombia. Why did you come to the U.S.? To walk us through that decision. And Yes, you know. that is that is actually a, a nice story. And I hope we have enough time. I have oh, enough. yeah. <laughs> we got time. We got time. <laughs> so. All right. So. I, I cannot really talk about civil engineering and being a civil engineer without mentioning my dad and, and my family. I I was blessed, you know, I was born in Colombia uh, in a family that has always been associated with civil engineering, which is, it's great. I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't realize it very young, but then I kind of catch up. Uh, everyone in my family, when you look back from my grandfather and even before that, they were all engineers. Um, and, and, and I don't want to come across as, you know, we are engineers, we have a company, we're rich. No, it was never like that. It was it was more through people with passion for engineering. Uh, we did actually not even have a company until my dad got a company. But but it was great because it was like, you know, it was a pride of being a civil engineer and what that represented, you know, and, and the way that you position yourself in society, you know, saying this is a, it's an awesome job. So it started with my family. I, I kind of started getting involved, you know, like into the profession. My dad was a, was a contractor. He, he worked for a few years there with somebody else. And then he went independently, kind of towards the end of his career, really. But anyway, when he was a, a young person and a student, he got a scholarship at Purdue in, in Indiana. So he went there. He got his degree in 1969. He went back to Colombia. And when I was growing up, you know, we, we knew about Purdue more than the United States because it was such a pride for him that I, I grew up kind of, you know, having the name, going to Purdue during my vacations with my dad. We visit a couple of times. Uh, so I, I think it was all kind of starting to click in my mind that, you know, civil engineering in the U.S. was a big deal. You have great schools. 
uh, I always thought I was going to end up going to Purdue, you know, because of that indoctrination. But, you know, things in Colombia in the 90s were not the, you know, were not the best times in the world, we can say. Uh, you know, if you watch Narcos or if you know about Pablo Escobar and all that, uh, it's all true, man. All those shows is exactly what was going on in the 90s. I mean, I grew wow. up, uh, I was lucky enough, I was in a great family, but you still cannot deny the violence that was going on and, and all those things. Uh, the 90s was a really complicated time in Colombia. And as a result of that, you know, I graduated high school in 1996. So it was complicated because that's kind of when I started thinking, you know, maybe doing my bachelor's in Colombia and then doing my master's in the U.S. Uh, my dad was completely sold on the on that. And we came in 1996, exactly. I mean, it is today, it's 20, yeah, that will be, what, 24 years ago. Wow. We visit a few schools, uh, you know, we visit Purdue. And then when we came back, my dad said, you study civil engineering here in Colombia. When you finish and you graduate, we can send you to the U.S. You can do a master's on, on geotech at Purdue. You come back and you take the company, you know, the family, and we're going to start this. And I was completely sold on this story. Uh, and then what happened is the whole country started going downhill, you know, and my dad's company ended up decreasing and decreasing to a point that he he basically became more like a consultant, you know, for different, like, bigger, bigger associations and things like that. But when I was finishing school, the option of going to Purdue was gone, at least paying, you know, on, on the family. Uh, and actually, for a while, I, for the last six months before I came to the U.S., actually, my plan was going to go to Barcelona. The university that I was back in Colombia had a great program with the Universidad de Catalunya in Barcelona. And my plan with all my professors was just to go, you know, finish my bachelor's in Colombia and then go to Barcelona, try to do a master's and PhD. Okay. So, you know, I kind of was going on that way because that's kind of where the money for scholarships was coming. And then out of nowhere uh, in 2001, Dr. Luis Vallejo from University of Pittsburgh he ended up going to Colombia to teach a summer class in landslide stabilization. And I took that class because it was during the summer and I always love everything that was landslide related. And this is like stuff for dreams. You know, I go and take the class. It's a master level class, but I'm in undergrad. So, you know, I'm taking the class. Everyone obviously it's at least five years older than me. At that time, I used to have long hair and a completely different look than now. So I take the class and then at the end of the class, it was like a two week class. Uh, this probably saw out August or something like that, 2001. He he approached me and said, it's evident that you love geotech engineering and you are very passionate about this. Uh, what if you come to the States with, you know, back, you know, kind of with me, almost with him, uh, and you start a master's at the end of the month? All expenses covered. In a and, month? Yeah, in a month. So I was like, what? And I was like, I thought it was a process of applying like a year <laughs> before. And then he said, it is, it is. But then the problem is he got, it was something with the National Science Foundation. He got a grant. He was not going to get the grant, but something ended up happening, and they notified him super late. So basically, at the end, they came and said, hey, you are going to have a grant. It needs to start in September. Um, so yeah, find a student. Now, they communicated this to him right before he went to Colombia. So I guess he had a problem, because at that point, all the, you know, like the universities at that time already have everyone assigned. So, you know, he went to Colombia and he was still trying to solve the problem of getting a student. And then he saw me. Uh, and, you know, I mean, when you are 22 years old, you have long hair and you don't really care much about life. You take any option that life throws at you. Exactly. So, you know, I was like, I still have six months to finish my undergrad, but I'm sure we can make it work. And we did that. I mean, I ended up going and talking to all my professors and I say, hey, this guy has this. So we kind of make it work. And I, it's funny because like two weeks about, Two weeks after that conversation, I was in Pittsburgh, and I have no clue where Pittsburgh was because I only knew where Purdue was. You know, so, <laughs> so it's funny because I I came to Pitt. Uh, at, I have no idea what Pitt was. You know, I'm not the typical story of people saying like I really want to go to the University of Illinois because I followed the you know Peck and Mesri and all that. Uh, I wish I had a story like that, but no. For me, it was all Purdue. I never even attempt to apply to Purdue. Then it was going to Barcelona. And then out of nowhere, this option came. So the first thing I did when I came to Pittsburgh, I remember was going to a computer lab and Googling. At that time, it was not even Google. It was like Netscape or Top yeah. File or one of those, you know. And then literally just look in Pittsburgh. And they were like, ah, OK, so now I understand where I am in the world. And yeah, so it, it's far from a romantic story in, in that sense. But that's the place that I came. 
Uh, I did my master's. You know, I, I have a great time with my advisor, Fox Vallejo. We work on, we're trying to find elastic modulus with, you know, P waves and shear waves and cross sonic logging, basically. Uh, I love the work that we did there. I, I fall in love with the university. I fell in love with the city. Uh, and then at the end, my advisor said, hey, if you really want to go to Purdue, uh, we can try to apply and we can see maybe you can do a PhD there. But at, at that point, I, I, I love it too much. And I said, no, I want to continue with you. Uh, so I did my, my PhD here in Pittsburgh and I graduated from it. Yeah, I don't know. It took me five years for the whole combo of master's and PhD. And, and then after that, I, I thought about going into you know, academics and maybe trying to find a position as a professor and things like that. Uh, but I realized it was not really for me and, and my intentions were a little different. So I ended up finding this company, American Geotechnical Environmental Services. And, you know, it's been, I don't know, almost 15 years since then. So it, it's been a great, I mean, I can tell you it's been a, a great career, a great life. I, I'm, I'm extremely thankful for everything. You know, uh, I, I owe everything to my, you know, all advice of Dr. Vallejo. Uh, he was the, the mentor and the help that I needed at the right moment. And he gave me an opportunity that, end up bringing more and more opportunities. I mean, you know what they say, when you work hard, you, you tend to get lucky, correct? So, you know, fortunately, luck keeps keeps coming back. So, I, I, and it's funny if I can tell you a little more about it. Yeah, because, please do. You know, after a few months that I was in Pittsburgh, I, I asked, you know, I started working with Dr. Valero at Pitt and he was happy. And then I said, you know, I really appreciate everything that is happening, but, you know, like, why you pick me? You know, why, why you, you, you saw like potential on me, you know, and you wanted to give me a chance. And then he said, well, it was, it was one homework that I left. So he left us one homework on that class that I took in 2001 in, in the summer class. That it was a very conceptual question, you know, and, and it was something about a, a failure plane, I think. So it was basically asking which, you know, he drove like three and he said, which one of you guys think just on basic concepts is gonna give you the lowest factor of safety? So I did the exercise the way he wanted, but I also, you know, it, there is no translation in Spanish to copyright. You know, there is no copyright in much because when you grow up in Bogota, man, you can find any program, any software, any movie that you want for $1 right on the street. So at that time, even though I was still on my undergrad, I have everything. I mean, I have W slide, the slope W, you know, like slope W, like any program that you can imagine. I had it because they were like, you know, they sell you a CD. I mean, even the professors used to encourage you to go and buy those things. So when I did the homework, you know, I also printed, you know, I also did it like in three different software uh, and I printed and I submitted like that. And when he saw it, he actually thought that I owned the program. So he asked me, say, how did you do this? You know, with the three different programs? I say, I own it. And he's like, do you have licenses on that? And I didn't even really got the license part. So I was like, yeah, I own them. I mean, I have this and I have sub 2000 for structural stuff. And he probably thought that I was insane. You know, I mean, he was probably like, who at that age buys this software? Because I said, yeah, I bought it with my own money. <laughs> so he said, I mean, if somebody has the money to invest on that and is so passionate about geotech, deserves to, to have this. So I always say to have those mis little misinterpretations that, that really got me here, but, so but it was cool. And yes, yeah, so that's, that's the way that I end up here. I, I was lucky enough, my, my wife now, that used to be my girlfriend at that time, uh, we were already together. And when I came with that, she, she's younger than me. So when I, you know, a, a couple of years after that, she applied to Pitt for, a, for another scholarship. She's also a civil engineer. And well, she's actually a, a chemical engineer by training, but she's a master's on environmental engineering, which is the same department. So she ended up applying for a, for a scholarship and she got it. And then she was able to, to come here. And that's how we end up here. And, and same story when she finished her master's, she started working for different companies. And yeah, and then it's been 15 years and, and we love it. I mean, we, we live right here in Oakland, which is very close to the university. This is the area that we, that we like. Uh, our son goes to the University of Pittsburgh School, which is called Folk School. And we are all, we are all Pitt all the way. So <laughs> even though I still say that my biggest passion is the Colombian national soccer team. There that you go. Never change. <laughs> you cannot give me enough American football or basketball. Soccer will always be number one in my heart. <laughs> Man, that's, that's awesome, man. It's awesome. So much to unpack there. I mean, I just think that I it's know, great that like you have an opportunity, you, you jump headlong into it. You're like, you're off the plane. You're here in Pittsburgh. You're like, oh, by the way, let's, you know, ask Jeeves or whatever, like, where is Pittsburgh? <laughs> it's just like, you know, sometimes, especially as engineers, we have to make a decision. We, we try to map out all the pros, all the cons and yes. try to figure out what's the best decision. But sometimes, especially when you're young in your career and 
opportunity comes, you say, you know, I just got to jump on this and just see what happens. And it looks like it was the right decision for you. It you is. Know? It is funny what you say, because, yeah, I mean, we and I'm sure you are the same way as engineers. We tend to calculate all that. Yep. When I look back in my career, like none of the important decisions that I took were calculated. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like the, the fact of coming here, you know, it was in one minute. I mean, Dr. Vallejo had not even finished saying, would you consider going like in two weeks or three weeks to the U.S.? I was like, yeah. I mean, it, it's, I believe that, you know, the most important thing really happened so fast uh, and, and you have confidence and trust on yourself that you can kind of take a decision on the spot. And, and it kind of goes the same. And that's probably what I also like construction consultation in geotech because you don't really have a lot of time. You, you need to get a concept uh, and have fundamental basis for that, but you don't have the luxury of, you know, extended periods of time. You have to kind of go. So, yeah. yeah. That's so true. That's so true. And, you know, you talk about a field like geotechnical engineering. One of the things that attracted me to geotechnical engineering is there's so many options, right? There's so many things you could do within it. But for yeah. you, it seems like you went more of a design route than a, a traditional construction route. Can you walk us through how you got to that decision? Yes, absolutely. That, that, that connects very well with my dad again, because, you know, obviously I wanted to go on what he was doing, which was construction, you know, and, and he was not doing it specifically geotech, but he was highway construction. So it was, you know, transportation geotechnics. And I grew up going to sites with him. And, you know, I, I learned how to drive a dozer at a very young age. And I started doing recons, you know, like geotechnical recons and rock slide recons very young and, and things like that. So I always thought that my, you know, that my field was going to be on, on construction. I also, I mean, I got a PhD and I love it, but I enjoy simple things in life. I'm a very simple person. Hmm. I enjoy simple things and I want to always give them sim you know, things as simple as they could. Yeah. So I always thought that construction was perfect for me because it's more like, a, I, I thought it was a simple thing. It's not, it's by far is not, but, but I thought that it was more like hands on approach. So then when things change, you know, I, and I discovered geotech engineer probably like on my second year, uh, you know, I kind of approached my dad and say, I, I love engineering, but I, I think I'm shifting from construction management uh, to into geotech, which he was thrilled. I mean, he, you know, obviously he was gonna, he was gonna like every, anything that I that I was gonna choose because of passion. You know, like if I was really passionate. So I kind of started going into that, and I realized, you know, when you, it's a great feeling, and I, and I know, Jared, when you found your moment, uh, I, I have been reading a lot about you, so I feel that I'm an expert. You know, I know you went to Syracuse for your masters and your PhD at Illinois. Uh, you initially no, wanted no, to no. work. You, you put me too far ahead, too far ahead. <laughs> and, you know, and, undergrad, and, undergrad at Syracuse and then master's in Illinois. I can't, oh, no, I can't sorry, sorry, PhD. master's at Illinois. <laughs> and I know your favorite professor was Mesri. So oh, you there see, you go. I, there you go. I also found that. So, and I think your favorite class was soil mechanics. Man, right? you, did, you did your homework, professor. <laughs> I, I, man, I'm telling you, man, I have been following for a while. That's I what I'm it. saying. I, I don't take this invitation light because Thank you so I have much. been honestly following you for a while. Not That's in a cool. creepy way, in a professional way. <laughs> so when I got the invitation, I was like, excellent. Uh, you may be surprised also that I, I know that you initially wanted to go for architectural, you know, oh, wow. and more than civil engineering. But then okay. when you went to Syracuse, things kind of end up changing and you go for that. Yes. So this was not that different that, you know, I, I started thinking I was going to go into construction, mm. uh, but then I start falling in love with geotechnical engineering. I think that for me, the simplicity was what brought me, you know, like, I just remember taking soil mechanics and, you know, going through consolidation and, you know, they were kind of teaching us, you know, how to calculate soil behavior and calculate time rate of settlement and amount. And, you know, the professor at that time was giving us a lot of examples. And I just remember thinking like, wait a minute, I can make a living just doing calcs and predicting this. I mean, it looks so nice and so simple. You know, I was like, this is just statics. I mean, you know, soil mechanics is nothing different than statics and like physics too. So that started attracting me. And, and I think that's the time that I said, okay, I'm gonna go all the way. You know, I mean, like I want to learn everything that is to learn. And it also comes with a feeling of, I want to become an expert. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, and, and at that time you're fortunate enough. And I, I was definitely lucky enough that I had a lot of freedom and not everyone has that freedom in the sense that because of different circumstances in life, you may need financial, situation that you need to provide for your family. I mean, I left my home when I was 22 uh, and I completely left my home. I mean, I took care of myself since that age, you know, wow. but not everyone has that luck, you know, and, and that luxury and you need to, maybe you don't have the luxury to do a PhD for five years because you need to provide for others in your family or you already started your own family. So, so I was lucky enough that I said, I love my girlfriend and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to marry her. 
one day, but for now, I want to focus on, on learning geotech. And, and I did, man, I, I became a professional student. I published 20 papers before I graduated from my PhD. Wow. Uh, I covered geotech, I mean, I have two in geo, in geotechnique, which for me was the best thing. Yeah. Like when I was in grad school, I was not really doing much of like, you know, Friday movies or anything. I was reading geotechnique, ASC, <laughs> Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental. Yeah. I became a reviewer for the Japanese Society of Solemn Foundations Journal. So wow. I lived that and I enjoyed everything like that. I, I, I was extremely passionate. So obviously through all this process, you know, and, and since the beginning, I realized I was not going to really go in construction, right? Because mm. I was being more suited for, for design. Uh, and then I remember one day when I was at Pitt on a, you know, on a graduate class seminar and then Neil Styler, he's the, he's one of the owners of Ages. Uh, after the class, he approached me and, you know, I think my advisor told him that I, I was going to graduate soon. And I just remember because he looked at my eyes and said, excellent. So, I mean, not much of an introduction. And then he said, are you interested in pursuing a career as a consultant engineer? Uh, and again, I didn't really have complete clear what consultant engineer is, but if somebody asks you something like that, you always say, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, I'll figure out what it is later. And so I did that. I interviewed with him and, and yeah, and it was great. And, and I, I, I think I was lucky enough that, you know, I start doing the regular stuff, design and, you know, and, and the traditional part of being more involved in design than construction. But that part inside me was always there of trying to go back into construction. And then it also happened to be the time that Pennsylvania Department of Transportation started shifting into design build approach mm -hmm. that you can team up with a contractor and then you do the whole design for, you know, for final design. So that was great. And then I was able to kind of get into that early. And, and you know, that's honestly what I love. I mean, design build for me is, is the best thing that I can do because I have all my technical aspects, my design, but I also team up with a contractor and then I can enjoy the construction and everything that is associated with it. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Can you walk us through some of the technical things that you've done or that you do? Oh, absolutely. I'll give you my greatest hits because I have very documented. So uh, I always said one of my... One of my biggest things are, you know, like the big bridges in Pennsylvania. So we have the CSBT bridge, which was finalized this year. That, that thing was in design for almost 10 years. Uh, the reason that is so special to me is because it was the time that Ashto and Pendor were changing the approach and design of drill shafts. Uh, before, you know, if you remember like the early versions of Ashto, like, you know, Ashto 98, and then when it went to the 2000s. Oh, that's the other thing, man. I'm crazy about design manuals. I have ah. always been. So I collect them, I read them, and, and I talk to them as if they were records, you know, from like music artists and stuff. Yeah. And, and everyone finds it a little creepy in my own. I think it's awesome, man. <laughs> so I, I, I'm always referring like, oh yeah, Ash to 2005, you remember when they tricked the equation and, and things like that, and they induced the alpha factor. So, but anyway, long story short is Ash to for a while was always saying, you design a drill shaft based on end bearing, or you design it based on side friction. You don't really combine both. And Pendor adopted that way, which was like, since you don't know the interaction between the two, you're gonna go either one way or the other. So then, you know, Dan Brown and Associates, you know, and, and I mean, Dan Brown and, and his awesome team, you know, that worked with him, he started doing research with that with FXWA. Uh, he published on the, on the, I guess the GEC for drill shafts in 2010. He came back with like very simplified equations that were suggesting that you can combine two. Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation then jumped into that around 2014 and produced on their manual, they say, okay, for the first time, we're going to allow you to use both, okay, but you need to predict the interaction. And they give you some basic principles of, of how to kind of do the combination. Without getting too technical, the, the number is 0.4 inches. You know, when you pass 0.4 inches of movement, you lose your bond on site. Uh, but you're still far away from your ultimate on bearing, which is typically around 5% of your diameter of the base. So they provide like some very basic rules. Um, we were doing this CSVT bridge at that time, massive drill shafts, and you, we did an initial design and then, you know, Pendot came back to us and said, what would happen if we use the new equations? And at that point, I mean, keep in mind, I probably have been doing drill shafts and things like that for 10 years. Yeah. And now somebody's coming and telling you, use new equations that are way more aggressive. So I was like, all right, let's take a look. So we did, and we were able to cut the shafts by about half, you know, wow. which when you are talking big diameter shafts, it's yeah. a lot of money. It's a lot of money so, and time and time and, and material time. too. Yeah. Exactly. So always depend on what like, okay, we feel, we feel great about it. Uh, why do you recommend to be able to confirm? And I say, well, all cell tests, you know, I mean, we all, 
We all know where all sales is. And I have a personal anecdote with all sales because the week that I joined Ages, we were doing an all sales test. And one of my previous mentors, Gene Lipo, which he, he retired a long time ago, uh, he sent me to you know just check it out. When I went, I thought that an all sale was something that you do on a regular basis, you know. <laughs> So I went there. I, I did. That was the every project uh, experience. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so I was like, oh, okay, that's you know. I felt like as I was just going to see a pile being driven. Yeah. And I remember looking at the old set. I was like, ah, oh, that's cool. I even didn't even take a picture because oh. I thought, you know, I, I was like, get it on my... the next project. I'll take a picture yeah. of the next project, right? I, mean, I was like, this is just my first week. So I was like, I'm sure I'm gonna be seeing old sale tests every two weeks. So I didn't even document it or anything like that. Um, I went, got a look, awesome. Then after that, you know, five years passed and I was like, man, I really screwed it up because that was, you know, they don't come as often. So when Pendle approaches on this one and say, what would you like to do? Obviously I said an OSIL test. And, you know, I said, let's do an OSIL test, but I want a big one. You know I mean? I want to test, I want to test everything, the side friction, the end bearing. They give me a lot of freedom and they say, why don't you work with the, you know, with the lows, you know, like the low test group and, and, you know, kind of come together in a, in a test that is going to prove everything. And they said, if we do this, it's going to be great because then we can use it to prove that the equations on DM4 apply. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Uh, it's one of the best things that, that I always show in my presentations. I did the calc for the whole thing in less than half a page by hand, wow. you know, kind of on the back of yeah. the envelope. <laughs> and, and I say, this is the configuration that we need and this is the thing. So, so we did it. They gave us the money. I mean, obviously, they all sell tests of these magnitudes. Uh, I think this test, I mean, I can, I can tell you numbers because this is all public. Mm -hmm. The whole test ended up costing 350000 just on, on the contractor, wow. plus all of our time and, and everything associated. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the test. When we were doing the test, I, I, you know, I, I got everyone on site, even the pen of people, you know, and I said, well, this is a very important day for me, and I want to give you my results before we do the test. So I say, this is going to take 9,300 kips, and it's going to, based on my computations, it's going to deflect 0.4 inches. Okay. Uh, and then everyone was, you know, like laughing and saying, okay, well, that's that's great. The guy that was doing the OSIL test, they work a lot in Florida and he actually worked a little bit in South America. He looked at me and said, you're insane, man. We never get to those loads because typically, typically what happened is that you under predicted the capacity of the shaft. So when we get to the maximum graded capacity of the test itself, you have not reached the ultimate values that you thought you had on your design. Uh, obviously, his experience is also a lot in, in, in weaker materials. You know, we were in a, in a semi-competent material. So I said, okay, that, that's an opinion. That's fine. So I say, let's just all put 20 watts, you know, and then whoever ends up closer in this value, take it off. Uh, <laughs> some people actually started thinking, but then the, the construction director from Pendot came and said, no, man, I mean, I love your idea, but I cannot allow like gambling, you know, <laughs> in, in, in a Pendot project. I mean, that's almost like we were drinking. So I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> We did the test, uh, the thing, so I predicted 9,300 and it ended up failing at 9,300 plus 500. So it was basically 93, you know, it was okay. extremely close. Yeah. Now the deflection, I predicted 0.4 and it failed at 0.35. I, wow. At the moment that it failed, yeah. the guy, the, the same guy that told me we could not, you know, we cannot bet, he looked back at me and I said, I don't know how much you're getting paid, but go and ask your boss to pay you twice, man, because if wow. you can predict to this kind of thing, <laughs> So it, it was a great experience. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I promised them, I say, you'll see, I'll do a paper. It was, it, it was great. I mean, after that, I ended up putting a paper that went in DFI and, and I ended up going around for different presentations, you know, like around the country and stuff. Uh, it, it's one of those things that it was great the way that happened and all that. Uh, I remember once I was doing a presentation and one of my good friends was actually attending. And then just for kicks at the end, he asked me and said, have you ever think that, you know, maybe you just got lucky with one test? I mean, can you generalize <laughs> that the equations are just, you know, and I'm like, I am extremely aware, but I don't want to ruin my own part. You don't want to ruin it, exactly. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going around the country and showing this. And, and it was great. And, and, and actually, after that, I, I, I was very pleased because I did a presentation at the Central, Central PA Geotech Conference in Hershey which is by far my favorite, one of my favorite conferences in the world, because man, it's like you have, I love Hershey bars, my favorite chocolate. <laughs> chocolate and you have everywhere. a geotech conference <laughs> at the hotel with everything Hershey related. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I, I was presenting there and then right before my presentation, I don't remember who exactly, but it was somebody from Dan Brown Associate and he presented similar to what I did, but five tests. So he went Kenya and the Northeast and he was basically showing that the equations, you know, from Ashto, you know, work and you can combine both and all that. 
which was funny because when I presented, I was like, this dude just stole my thunder. I mean, with, you know, I was going to present you one test. I was doing a presentation. I was going to talk 40 minutes about this test. And this guy just smoked me, man, with so many tests. It's like, I was like, let's skip all these slides, you know, and let's go straight into the result. And it's everything he said. I also got it. So, but no, it's good. And, and, and that's really what I also love on Geotech Conference, which is that camaraderie and, and seeing the results yeah. of others. And, you know, it, it, it's great. So that's that's one of my of my favorite projects. I'll be quick on the other ones. The, the other sure. major one is the, I was called to do the geotech sections, to be the co-author of the geotechnical sessions for the state of Delaware Bridge Design Manual. Mm -hmm. So that to me was very special because being a fan, you know, being a big fan of design manuals, which I recognize not everyone is a big fan. It, it, you know, the moment that you are called and it's like, okay, now we want you to do one. So that was an awesome process. Uh, I, I love the state of Delaware. It's great. I love the drive from Pittsburgh to Delaware because it reminds me everything that is beautiful in this country. You start in the Appalachian Mountains. Wow. You go to the valleys in Maryland. Then you go to DC and Baltimore and all that crazy city environment. Then you cross and you go to Delaware. That is a great state, beautiful views. Uh, we always have the meetings in Dover. So I was going to Dover very often. I learned a lot about the history of Dover. Yeah. Visit a lot of things there. And, and it was great. And then at the end, we we finished the manual with the AECOM. It was a it was a collaboration with AECOM and, and Paul Moffitt from AECOM and Neil Shimo. And it was great. We put the manual. The state of Delaware was very pleased. So then we continue and we did training on the manual. So mm -hmm. we train consultants and we also did internal training. And, and it's a great experience. Uh, it was also always sponsored by FWA. So it was great also we were working with them. So, yeah, so I give you one structure, then I give you, you know, the, the design manual. And then the other one is okay. the Chirahara Bridge, which is the one in Colombia that I think mm. you, I'm sure you want to ask me about that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep that one for that question. <laughs> yes. Tell us about it. Tell us about it. Because I understand so, the bridge firm in Colombia invited your firm. Oh, man, that's even bigger. It's even well, bigger. Than that. Walk us through it. Walk us through it, man. It, it was my 15 minutes, of, 15 minutes of fame in Colombia. So Okay. I mean, keep in mind what I was telling you, correct? I came to the States, I came to Pittsburgh when I was 22, long hair, completely different attitude in life. Uh, you know, I finished my degrees here. I started working here. I, I always remain connected to Colombia because obviously my parents live there and my friends still, you know, I mean, I still have many friends there. I, I would say now I tend to go two times a year, twice a year, maybe, you know. Uh, I always went to all my friends' weddings and things like that. I mean, that's something that I enjoy just going for all these special events. So I, I have a, a, a close relationship with the country, but not really with the profession. My dad is retired from engineering. So, so really, I kind of disconnected a little bit. Um, and then January 15th, I mean, I still remember the date. It's a oh. date that it's always going to be remembered in Colombia, probably for the bad reasons. And, and it's kind of like the dark side of this. But anyway, January 15th, uh, a humongous bridge they were constructing there, which was called Chirahara Ridge, collapsed. Um, it's, it was part of a P3 kind of project, the pre, you know, public-private partnership. It's a concessionary, basically, the one that owns the, you know, the, the bridge and, and the new alignment. Um, and it failed. A lot of the sudden, they were constructing this. It failed. It was very unfortunate. Ten people died, you know, ten workers wow. died. It could have been way more than that because it failed during the, it failed during lunchtime. And most of the workers were outside. You know, they were basically having lunch. There were only 10 people that were doing like welding or something. It was, it, it was, it was going to be a beautiful cable stay bridge, two big towers for the piers, and then the cables. And it was going to be an icon. Uh, I believe it was probably less than a month before the president of Colombia actually was at the site. And he gave a very nice speech. I think they took it out from YouTube after the collapse. But at that moment, it was a nice speech because he, he said, this is what Colombian engineering can do. You know, it was completely designed in Colombia, completely constructed in Colombia, and it's also under this design build P3 kind of model. So this is the filter. Yeah. Uh, it was great and all that. And then on the 15, it collapsed. So I use an app, I don't know if you use it, but I use an app that is called WhatsApp, you know, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like yeah. text messages and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. In Colombia, WhatsApp is the most important thing that you have on your phone. I mean, it's mm -hmm. Because that's the way that people, you know, call each other and connect and all that. So I, I have a lot of chats on WhatsApp with friends from high school, friends from college in Colombia, family and all that. And, and that day, January 15th, for some reason, I was super swamped that afternoon. And I just hear my phone like ringing like messages, messages, wow. messages. And I, I didn't see anything. I remember I was at the office and I was like, I need to finish this and go home. So I finished what I was doing, came home. 
sit on my living room. Uh, I have a very special place in my living room with a beautiful view, similar to what I have behind. Uh, but you know, it's a very nice view of Pittsburgh. And I just remember thinking like, okay, let's see what is on the phone that has been ringing up. And then everyone was sending the video because they captured that video, you know, of the collapse. And, and again, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that when I look at, I feel bad because we never forget that 10 people died on what you're seeing. Yeah. So, but I just remember thinking that, looking that and saying, man, why this kind of stuff happen? I mean, why in Colombia? You know, I mean, it, it's kind of like the country has already too many problems to, yeah. to have this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, we don't have that kind of stuff in the US, correct? Mm -hmm. So, because a lot of these things you can predict or, or you can prevent. Mm -hmm. So I just remember thinking that having a two minute reflection of thinking like, man, good thing I work in the US and we put effort on things and, and stuff like that. The last thought that I had was, I feel bad for the poor guy that is gonna end up having to deal with the expert testimony on this thing and mm -hmm. trying to understand what went wrong, correct? Yeah. So I have that thought. I mean, I feel it like if it was yesterday, even though it's almost three years. Uh, and then I, you know, I told my wife and she saw, yeah, I also saw it and, and we, you know, we kind of went to bed. Then next day, I got a call very early in the morning, which is from the branch manager of our office in DC, which is Adam Marl. He called me and said, hey, there is a potential possibility of, of working on a bridge that collapsed in Colombia yesterday. And I was like, yeah, I saw it, you know, but I mean, the thing is, keep in mind, the farthest that I worked before that was the Delaware Manual in Delaware. I mean, Dover was as far as I went, you know, and, and Ohio to the other side. <laughs> So it's like going from there to Colombia. So I was like, okay, that would be cool. So I say, well, explain more. And then what ended up happening is that the, the company, the you know, like kind of the concessionary they owns the thing, which is called Kobe. And this they they basically contacted 20 companies around the world and say, I need a forensic analysis to understand what went wrong. Uh, it happened that one of those companies is called Majestic Masters. And you know, they they, they have many offices, but the one that I work actually is based in Philadelphia. Uh, there is someone there that I have admired for a long time, uh, Tom Murphy. He, he's an expert, great designer. He has a lot of great common sense, and he has specialized in forensics. And I have seen some of the papers and some of the stuff that he has done. So I kind of knew Tom a little bit. I think I knew Tom the same way, Jared, that I know you, but yeah. you didn't know me that well. I tend, <laughs> to idealize, I tend to idealize a lot of people in the industry, and then I realize they don't know me, but I really know everything <laughs> about them. You know. Uh, and, you know, so I I kind of have that feeling. I, Adam Marl have a better relationship with him. But anyway, I think Tom remi remembered me a little bit and he knew I was from Colombia. And he remembered that I have worked before on shafts and the foundations for this bridge were shafts. So he contacted me and said, are you interested? And I was like, sure. He said, the only thing is that if we pass this proposal, this company is gonna take a decision uh, and we have to commit to be in Colombia in 48 hours. And again, going back to when I was 22, coming back wow. to Pittsburgh, man, I was thinking I'm gonna have my mental long hair, same attitude as when Dr. Vallejo approached me and asked me to come to Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I said, you got it, man. If we get wow. it in 48 hours, I'll be in Colombia. Wow. So it was like that and then we got it. And then I have to fulfill my promise. So I end up calling Adam and he's like, Adam, you're coming with me. And I end up taking also our chief geologist, Al Hardawish, and we went to Colombia. Now this part was interesting because and I didn't really realize this at the beginning when it was, I mean, everything happened so quick. But when we were at the airport and all that, obviously, you know, I said, I, I can stay with my family. But they said, no, 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 don't worry. They will take care of accommodations and, you know, they will pick you at the, air, at the airport. And it's kind of a big deal because it's big news in Colombia, like the entire <laughs> country is following this news. So, you know, kind of when I was on the plane there, I started realizing that I was going to Colombia, but in a different condition. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I typically go to Colombia. My dad picked me up. Nobody wow. cares that I'm going, you know what I'm wow. saying? I mean, it's, but now it's like, we are going there as the American experts, you know? Wow. And it's like, this is your American expert. So, <laughs> you know? so I end up going there. They pick, I mean, for the first time in Colombia, they pick me up at the airport and there is a, it's a guy with the sign. I think they actually didn't even realize that I was originally from there. They knew I speak Spanish and probably because of my name, they knew that it was some heritage there, mm -hmm. but I don't think they really knew the whole story. Uh -huh. So we go there, we landed like at 10 p.m., they have two SUVs, they pick us at the airport with bodyguards and all that stuff. They take us to a hotel. I mean, for me, it was like staying in a hotel in Bogota, man, it's like, <laughs> I have stayed in all kinds of places in Bogota, never in a hotel. So it was funny, they pick us up next day, they transport <laughs> us to the site. 
Uh, it was a fascinating story for everything that it encompasses. You know, yeah. I mean, just doing the forensic analysis for something that big, uh -huh. uh, we end up going inside the, the case. And I, I never saw anything like that of that magnitude in my career. It's a, it's a hollow case on about eight meters. So that's like 25 feet diameter, hollow wow. case on going all the way to probably around 120 feet into rock. It wow. has 100 anchors inside the case and going back mm -hmm. and about probably another 90 micropiles. I mean, it, it's a combination of every geotech system that you can imagine. Wow. Uh, you know, and it was very fascinating from the technical point of view. Also, I was going to Colombia often, which was great, you know, seeing family and all that. Uh, but really the part that I enjoy the most, and I, I apologize for being a little bit narcissist on that, but I, no, okay. I just love seeing myself on the news, you know, and it's not <laughs> like that. And obviously we were not allowed to speak with the media. The owner said, I don't want communication with anything, which was probably even better for me, but just appeared like on the news, you know, like the shots when we were doing the investigation. Yeah. Uh, then we end up meeting the, the minister of transportation and the, yeah, I guess the, the minister of transportation and the secretary of infrastructure of the country, which are pretty high. Politically, we end up visiting them because they wanted to hear from us firsthand, and it, it went it went fine. It was a great experience. Uh, I was also involved then on on the evaluation of the new bridge, the replacement bridge, and mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of stuff there that I cannot comment on. on yeah, you know, legal reasons and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been replaced yet. I think they are announcing construction starting probably by next year or something like that. But it's definitely a project that will always be close to my heart because yeah. it it gave me the chance to go back home in a whole different thing. And, and it was always funny on all these meetings when people realized, you know, and, and they were saying, oh, like, you are from Colombia. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I've been in the States almost 20 years. Obviously, I'm, I love this country and I'm American citizen. I became an American citizen. Very honored to have that privilege. Uh, so, I mean, I have dual citizenship, but, you know, I mean, obviously my heart will always be Colombian. So yeah. going back on that and, and, and becoming, it was great. It also opened a, a whole new door of opportunities because then after that, I, I got invited to a lot of like conferences and stuff like that. It, it kind of gave me a lot of great publicity. Uh, and actually that ended up even spreading even more into South America. And I ended up, I ended up going to even Brazil with other invitations to present at the geotechnical conference they organize every four years. So I was in Sao Paulo. And I know you love samba too, and, and Brazilian samba, which I also love. So Yeah, hey, you me, did your research, man. I, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> So, you know, I'm indeed impressed. <laughs> so, you know, going there, you take geotechnical conferences, which is one of the things that I always adore in my life, you know, mm -hmm. and you also put it in Brazil, man. So it's like you are getting everything together. You know what I'm saying? So it was a, and it was also like a keynote lecture. And I was the last one. I mean, I was like closing the event. And I will tell you, man, if you love conferences, the way they do conferences in Brazil is the best. I mean, for them, they have live music. When people come to the stage, when I was on my keynote speaker, man, they have like, you know, like smoke coming out and flowers and they have violins. I mean, I was like so overwhelmed. I was like, this is the way that we should do every conference in the world. And, and as I said, I mean, I love conferences. And when I look back in, even from when I was in school, I, I used to spend my summers going to conference. So I have been from Anchorage, Alaska to like nothing in the UK and different places. And, you know, having the opportunity to now do this in South America is the top, you know what I'm saying? And and yeah. and it's great. And like, for example, in Brazil, when they invited me, they say, well, we can arrange everything. So you come the night before your presentation, you have a few hours in Sao Paulo, you present, and then you go back. And I was like, no, man, I want to go there as long as you are willing to pay my hotel. I'm going to make a vacation <laughs> out of this thing. You know what I'm saying? So I went there, I listened to every single presentation, which was great, you know, and, and that, that's, it goes back to what I always believe, which is expose yourself to everything. And I, I was like that when I was, in, in college, in like any paper that comes to your desk or, or if somebody say, hey, check this out, check it, you know what I mean? Check or, it out, yeah. Check it out. I mean, obviously with the internet now, it's way easier than before, but I do have a collection, for example, of soil mechanic books in different languages. Nice. So that's a collection that I typically do if I go to a new place. So I have, you know, soil mechanics in Japanese and I have it also wow. in Portuguese and Spanish. I have <laughs> one in French. So it, it's just, I don't know, I think for me, I know I'm a little nerdy and weird, but it's cool things, you know, and, and obviously having that going back to South America and doing that in Brazil and all that is, it's great. So it, it that opportunity with the Chirahara Ridge opened a whole new set of opportunities. I I actually, I'm involved right now, let's say with many universities down there in you know, reviewing and, and being on different committees for mm -hmm. what they're doing there, which I love. I mean, collaboration like that, it's, it's great. And I mean, hopefully on the mentoring part, I can also create like a 
bridge and help maybe some students to come and connect with, you know, at, let's say Pete or any other university that is willing. I always said, I mean, not many people know it, but I still maintain in Colombia is the best exporter of geotechnical engineers in the world. Wow. I mean, we, we have such great programs there, uh, but then unfortunately, you know, I mean, there's the, the, I guess the investment in infra infrastructure, nothing is better mm -hmm. than the U.S. So when you are investing so much in the U.S., obviously you are going to attract the people, you know, they are going to come from here. Got it. Got it. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, just, I, I, I love your story and um, just this concept of if an opportunity presents itself to take it. I mean, to think that, you know, something like that could happen in your home country and you have the opportunity to be a part of the solution. It's just really powerful. And I think for a lot of our listeners, you know, some of them might be, you know, in class right now or working on a degree or early in their career. And they just say, you know, why am I doing this? Can I make a difference? But I think you're living proof that you truly can make a difference with the degree and with the thank experience. You know, yes. so thank I you. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Life is great. And then, you know, the other part that I'm a big fan and, and, and you obviously have seen it and I know you do the same because sometimes some posts and, you know, I have get inspiration from your post on LinkedIn to do some of my posts. I still remember. Vice versa. <laughs> I, I, I saw the one that you did with your Syracuse stuff, you know, like when you were like remembering the years at Syracuse and, and yeah. I'm proud of it. And, and, and it kind of, I, then after that, I did the one in Colombia. So I put some pictures of when I was in college. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, I get the inspiration, but it's the same thing. I mean, you get inspiration on everything. So just, just exposed to, you know, exposed to everything and, and great things will, will come your way, you know. But one true belief that I have, it's also put an effort to document the journey because yeah. you will realize at some point that sometimes, you, you know, people think it's lame or, or, or they think that it's like too narcissist, too centered on yourself, but... The thing is, if you don't document it, nobody's going to do it for you. And, yeah. and you are going to miss great memories. I mean, when you, and I'm sure it's the same. That's the reason I was saying with the Syracuse picture. Yeah. When you look back at, at, you know, when you look back to the picture and, and you remember where you were mentally at that point and how a lot of your dreams have become reality, it's wow. a great feeling. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I go back to that picture that I have doing like a, an unconfined compression test. Yeah. Uh, you know, with a friend that I have the long hair and like for us, that was the coolest thing, trying to find the elastic modulus of that material, which I realized many people at that age probably are not into elastic modulus, you know, not at all. Was. because the worst part for me was like, let's find that elastic modulus and let's compare it to Ashton 98. You know? nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Man, I tell you, it's it's amazing when we think about, you know, where we get our inspiration. You're right. It's like, you never know if you're inspiring anybody, you know, and, and you, you may not ever know until, you know, you, time yeah. has gone on that, oh, I did this because of you. And just hearing your story, and I know that, you know, your dad played an enormous role in your career and where you are today. And I, I understand that something almost tragic happened to your dad while working on a geotech project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Amazing yes, story. yes, yes, about it. So, yeah, so this is the part that goes back into Narcos and all those series in Netflix and stuff. So in 1990, so I was, I guess I was 11. I was going to turn 12 that year. Uh, my dad always used to take me to all the construction sites. So, and, and this is funny because, I mean, I have talked about this before, but I think the first time that I did openly, like, like a thousand people was at DFI, you know, on, on the conference. But it's something that I, I feel fine and I, I think it's important to share. So... It was, yeah, 1990, and then he was working in the middle of, of the jungle, literally, because it was a new road. Mm -hmm. And I used to go with him and spend, like, my summers, you know, just basically staying with him and going to the construction site and seeing all these cuts. Though the cuts really was what was capturing my imagination. Going back, that's really the part that I, I feel that was the first sign that I loved geotech engineering, doing these rock cuts, you know, and, and how you do it. So, and, and, you know, finding out the slope that you could do and, and all that part. So, but anyway, so we were doing this in a, a very remote area of Colombia. Um, we were there with my dad. He was like the head engineer. And then the resident engineer was there. A couple more engineers. And, and I think some other people. It was probably like six, seven of them. And then me. They were having a technical meeting. So they were all talking about this. And um, this is like a very small office. Again, in the middle of nowhere, just at the top of a hill. Mm -hmm. I'm on the, on the room next to it, you know, because I got bored on what they were talking. Uh, and then I'm looking, and I can see it as if it was 30 years ago, man. I'm looking at the horizon, beautiful Colombian view, you know, beautiful Colombian jungle. And then out of that jungle, probably about 50 guys come out with like full, you know, AK-47s, completely wow. masked uh, with the FARC, which was the Colombian guerrilla at that time. Uh, you know, and then they all came in, you know, in, into that. Uh, I did, I mean, I barely have time to go from one room to the other and say, hey, something is going on. I mean, and, but 
you know, my dad was like, what, what are you talking about? And he was still trying to get the information from me. When these guys entered the room uh, and it was like, everyone, you know, stay still, IDs. They, they asked for IDs and they start going one after one. So they were actually not even going for my dad. They were actually going for the resident engineer. But when they realized that, you know, my dad was there, it was like even better. So it's kind of one of those defining moments because basically they tied my dad, you know, his, his hands. They were very respectful. I mean, I'll give you that. I guess I have to give you something. So yeah. you know, they were very respectful. You know, they they said, don't worry, we're going to take it. Um, initially, they said that it was going to be to talk about the future of the country and, and the political things, uh, which obviously was not exactly true, but it was kind of. Um, and then they basically left. And then they told us nobody can leave this office, you know, in the next hour. And if somebody leaves, then we are going to kill. So we were like, Okay, message received. So they left. They left on the only car that we have, basically. And you know, they left on that. And then we we waited there. Uh, it's funny because I, they, they they put us actually on the sec. No, they put us on a, like a third room or something that did not have any windows. Okay, so we were there, and then we realized that the only thing that we could see because I was like, how do we know when we can get out of here? Yeah. So the only thing is that if you go to the roof, you know, kind of to the top, there was like a gap between the roof and the, I mean, remember, this is just a field operation. So it's not a really great house or anything like that. Yeah. And there was like a hole there. So I could see, so they lift me, you know, like the other engineers that were there lift me. Mm -hmm. And then I could see people. And then about, I don't know, maybe more like 30 minutes. It was not even an hour. Uh, I saw that everyone was gone. So wow. then after that, we said, should we wait the next 30 minutes or should we leave? And I guess we waited. It was no rush. Yeah. We really didn't want to get murdered right there. So we waited and then we came out. Uh, I mean, at that point, even though I was 12 and it's a very psychological thing, when you get into those situations, even though you're 11 or whatever, you are still, you know, survival mode. Yeah. So we said, okay, so how do we go from here? Uh, obviously at, at that time there were no cell phones, but it was just like radio communication. They took that. But somehow there was some way of transportation. It was like a tractor or something. So we were able to go like two of us into that. And then we, we went to the closest town or it's not even a town, but whatever. We were able to call something and we end up finally end up hooking up with a taxi or something like that that pick us up. I mean, this is hours and hours and hours. Yeah. So after that, we end up going to the first proper town, you know, uh, and then over there, we were able to find like a bigger taxi that took us to the next city. Uh, you know, and I mean, at that time, it's probably 10, 12 hours. I mean, it was continuous traveling. And then at that point, we went to the airport. Uh, and then I guess they ended up buying a ticket for me. I guess my, you know, the engineers that used to work with my dad. And I ended up going home, which the bad luck that I ended up landing in Bogota the day that it was my, mo my mother's birthday. And I was going to deliver the news that my dad was kidnapped. So... Oh, but I'm good pressure. So, wow. So we ended up going that. I, I told the, the family, obviously at that point, it became like, you know, almost national news, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it was funny. I mean, obviously funny is probably not the best word that comes to your mind right now, but it was. I mean, 30 years later, you have to take the, you know, the good and the bad. I always say tragedy plus time equal comedy. And that's the way that it's been associated with my brain. Wow. Uh, I mean, we we end up basically contacting the company that he was working with and, and all that stuff. It ended up being pure ransom money. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. you it, it's not a simple thing because yeah. these people were not bad people. I mean, obviously, they were not doing good actions, but mm -hmm. they were extremely respectful with my dad. They took him to the jungle. He was in the jungle for three months. Basically, they were walking during the day, uh, sleeping at night, always camping. My dad said that for three months, he did not feel any concrete or any asphalt or anything like that uh he he always takes the positive side of things yeah. so he said that it was a great vacation you know i mean it was <laughs> nobody will see that side of colombia you know in oh three my months. goodness wow. uh, he saw so many animals and so many the waterfalls he also say the waterfalls in the jungle wow. so uh I, I said it's funny because at the same time for me it was not even that bad to be honest after the kidnap because then i became like the kid that his dad is kidnapped at school. So all the teachers were super nice with me. Oh my uh, you know, I was trying for years to get into the soccer team of the school. Yeah. And then the, the coach came and said, hey, we're interested in your talent. We want you to play. And I was like, no, man, you're going to give me that for free just because you feel bad. Yeah. So I actually did not take that. Okay. Uh, uh, I got my first girlfriend, probably based on pity or something that she <laughs> liked me. You know, So 
it wasn't that bad. And, and when I look back, I mean, it was it was a difficult time. Yeah. Uh, good thing is that he ended up coming back after three months. Wonderful. Nothing happened to him. Uh, I will always remember the moment that he ended up being, I mean, uh, that will be for another episode, you know, the, the yeah. whole saga of how he was released and all that. Wow. He ended up walking for hours. Uh, they basically just released him outside the jungle and they put like something like $20 in his pocket and say, walk for hours and eventually you're going to see a little house. And, you know, there should be a taxi there that can take you to the next city. So anyway, when he arrived to the closest city, he called. And this may look super weird, Jared, but I'm also mm -hmm. a true believer of, you know, like you sometimes, you know, when things are going to happen. And mm -hmm. for me, it was very strange because I just remember that I was sleeping, you know, and I hear a phone. And for some reason, I knew it was my dad. And I just wow. answered, you know, this is the middle of the night. Yeah. And I answered and he was there. It, like it was something on me wow. that is like this is happening most yeah. probably a lot of candy and a lot of hope but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that's the way that it went uh wow. he came back with a huge beer and you know and and it, it was i mean it was a good time yeah. he they were always good with him you know he he was never in any in any trouble he did a couple of things he he taught them how to play chess so he had to carve his own chess set wow. so just, you know, he asked for a pocket knife which mm -hmm. at the beginning they were not very you know they were yeah. kind of reluctant to give the guy that they're you know, <laughs> saving to get a pocket knife. Yeah. But I guess they got a relationship that they trust him enough. So yeah. he got a pocket knife. He carved a, a, a chess game. He yeah. said that for a month, he let them win just so they were not going to get bored about him. <laughs> then after that, he really started playing. You know? So he kind of started, he, he taught him about, you know, about him playing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, what he always said, it's, it's a bad time, you know, it's the right, is the is the wrong moment, the wrong time. I mean, these yeah. guys were people that, you know, grew up in the middle of Colombia. They have access to zero possibilities in life. They didn't know anything better. Then the guerrilla comes and recruit them. So obviously you have to judge people by their opportunities. I mean, we can all get into our high horse and condemn people and saying you are bad people because you have done this. But, yeah. you know, it all depends on the opportunities that you got in life. And, and you know, um, unfortunately, we still have in Colombia people that, that you know are in extreme poverty and and you know what we judge as being acceptable it's the only option they have so yeah. it, it's a complicated thing I, uh, I mean fortunately colombia changed a lot when i came in 2001 it was probably the worst time i mean you know kidnaps and stuff were still happening things changed uh, a, a few years ago the government was able to to have a, you know a peace treaty all these you know guerrilla People end up being reinserted into the society. They now have their own political party. Uh, it, it, it's tough, and, and it was tough for a lot of the country to come into terms with this because obviously I was very lucky in the fact that with my dad and my family, it ended up in a in a good story that I can be here telling you and we can be laughing. Yeah, I have friends, and I know friends of my dad were civil engineers that were kidnapped, and they end up very different. You know, I mean, and, and they end up being killed. My dad actually, after that, was extremely thankful to many people that helped on his on his thing and and for years he actually helped on negotiations and stuff for kidnap all this was ransom money wow. so he was also working in that helping others and i mean i'm telling you man this is a whole different episode because it's, it amazing. Has, it, it's the whole thing that you get involved in that now all of the friends that he was they were all civil engineers and this okay. is kind of an irony because this is people that are great people educated people that are just trying to do the best for the country with a profession that is bringing development in, in, in areas that are completely isolated of the country. Mm -hmm. And just think about that your life is going to finish like this, just being wow. executed with a, you know, with a gun because wow. you were just trying to have a job and trying wow. to help these people. So, I mean, it, it's a lot of contradictions <laughs> there, but it, it's just the way. That's what we live. That's the time that we, that we had. And, and obviously, you know, that I'm a very positive person, but it's yeah. like I always remember this, and, and maybe that's the reason that I'm so positive because when you when you are aware how things could have turned for you, and you yep. realize the great present that you have, yeah. you become extremely thankful, and you want to live every day, you know, with with the sense of purpose, you know, to yeah. the sense of making it count. Because I could easily have gone the other way. I mean, just imagine that that kidnap of my dad would have gone the other way. Yeah. I would probably should have become super bitter about engineering. And about yeah. civil engineering, and you know, I, I who knows where the hell I would be right now. Yeah. So yeah, right. I mean, it, wow. it, it, it's something that I never really let to affect me in the in the view of engineering. Is things that happen. Uh, it, it gives me a great story because you know when we are in job sites and something is not going that well uh, with a contractor, you know, and they say, oh shit, you know, like, all this is going bad and and stuff like that. I always said, 
believe me, man, it could be worse. It could yeah. be worse if we are seeing 50 guys coming from the from the fields right now with AK-47 and you're going to get kidnapped. So, yeah, yeah it, it gives you a perspective. So, yeah, it's 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 a good story. I mean, as I said, for everyone that is listening, and if you have seen any of those, there is like a plethora of series right now about Colombia in the 90s. Even ESPN has one that is the story of the two Escobars in 30 by 30. Mm -hmm. My word is all that is true. I mean, for dramatic and, and awful as it looks, that's the that's what it was the reality. We just move on. You know, I mean, basically after all that, the country, Colombia has a great credit on that. The country completely reinvented themselves. Now, wow. right now, Jared, you can go and have the best vacation. Well, not right now, but when the COVID is yeah, gone. Yeah, after COVID, yeah. You know, you can go and I can guarantee you, you will have the best vacation of your life. Wow. And you will never imagine that 20, 30 years ago, the country was, I mean, I always say Medellin was the most dangerous city in the world in the age. Wow. Pablo Escobar is linked to the death of 4,000 people. You know, wow. I mean, we're talking big numbers here. So yeah. that's that's what it is. So wow. now you have to lift it, man, to a positive note. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, with all that, I mean, it, it, it helps, it helps me to understand why you're so passionate about what you do and, and, and why you're so positive. And again, I kind of learned about you through LinkedIn, of course, you know, following you, I've seen your posts and then kind of seeing you behind the scenes with the planning for DFI 45 with people, purpose, and passion. Just tell us a little bit about that experience of yes. you know, having oh, that I'll responsibility. Be, Cause it was a great conference. It was a great conference. I'll be happy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, as you can see, I'm still rocking people. Yeah, I see it, man. <laughs> so this, honestly, this happened, you know, this happened thanks to Mary Ellen and, and Teresa. I, I guess, as I was telling you before, I one of the reasons that I become involved with DFI was because of you. And you probably didn't even know that until today. <laughs> uh, because I saw you at that presentation in 2014 here in Pittsburgh. And I mean, I saw you and I saw Ed, uh, you know, and, and Eric Lawyer and, and many people that I was like, this is this is the kind of people that, that I like. You know, I mean, this wow. is the people that I, idealize and stuff like that. So I became more involved and then different opportunities kind of happened. I presented at a few S3 events. Um, uh, I, I mean, my son one day is going to tell his friends or, or girlfriend or whatever that he grew up on geotechnical conference. That's all I do, man. For me, there is no better vacation than a geotech conference in a city that I have not visited yeah. because you, have, you get everything. I go before, have a vacation with my family. Mm -hmm. Then I, I, I'm part of the conference. My son always goes to the exhibit room he gets all his toys or what he calls toys, which is more like freebies from there. And, you know, so it, it's a, it's a great environment. And, and I, you know, I kind of started involved in, in different conferences uh, and I always enjoyed. And then I went to Brazil where I was telling you that was part also related to the FI and I loved the experience. And I was very grateful to Mary Ellen and, and Teresa to kind of got me involved and kind of allow me to also grow on, on the FI um, the same way that I'm sure you are, you know, yeah. Now with the super pile being in Philly and all that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a great organization. So Teresa contacted me in, I think it was July of, yeah, 2018, I believe. No, 2019, sorry. It's, it's basically like a year and a half almost before the conference actually happened. So she contacted me and said, you know, do you want to do that? And for me, it was like, it was like the call to be here, man. It's like, I've been dreaming about this opportunity. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's like. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure that my that my employer was on board, you know, that because obviously it takes time. I'm sure you know now with Superpile. Oh yeah. You know, it, it takes time, but it's great time. I mean, it's for me, it's a dream control. I mean, imagine the guy that idealizes and enjoys conferences, mm -hmm. and then you get one of the biggest organizations in the world and saying, We want you to be the chair for this, <laughs> and we want your vision. Uh, and obviously, since the beginning, I, I did not have the people for post passion exactly like that. That ended up coming in actually as a with a marketing specialist. She was the one, Carol, she's a magician, yeah. you know, and she was, I talked to her for like an hour. And then I said, that's my view on life, Carol. How can you put that in three words? And then she said, it's people, purpose, passion. And that's what you represent. <laughs> so, you know, we came with the concept and, and we were trying a lot of different ideas. Uh, I'm all hand down technical. You know, I, I love technical aspects. Uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm the guy that reads every article on, on you know, on Geostrata and every article back to front on, you know, on the DFI magazine. Uh, I mean, that's my world. I love all that stuff. So I wanted the technical part, but I definitely wanted to bring something that was different, you know, and, and especially something that was not, that was not very expected, you know, and, yeah. and I think that keynote lecture that I was invited in Brazil helped a lot yeah. because it, it, it also opened my eyes, you know, on, on other ways to do things and, and go more into the personal aspect, you know, showing the personal side of things. Uh, I, I watched when I was in Brazil a, a, a 
it was like a panel discussion between the probably the two biggest legends in geotechnical engineering in Brazil. Uh, it also got me motivated to try to ask a question in Portuguese because I was so excited. Mm. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it was, they were basically just drinking there and telling the stories of their life. And I, I just remember thinking that would be a great, taking that concept and trying to make it into different sessions at a conference would be great. Yeah. I was also extremely motivated by Mike Wasaki, which is, he's going to be our future president of DFI. Uh -huh. He did the legends for his dad, you know, honoring his dad. Yeah. And he did a magnificent presentation showing the personal side. Uh, and that was the other one that I, I it all clicked in my, in my head. Yeah. So that was the way that I approached it. Uh, one great thing about DFI is that they have an amazing staff that takes care of a lot of things, you know, like yeah. coordinating the place, coordinating all the stuff, even taking the system. Uh, and there is there is a lot of great people, you know, like you that want to participate and want to be part of the, you know, of the technical program and they want to be part of the organization committee. Uh, so it was great because, you know, we we kind of divide the work into many, into many people and then it was manageable. Uh, as I say, the part that I love is that it completely gave me the chance to to show my view. And and I can't believe that, the, I mean, the, the feeling that I got the Friday that we finished, oh, it so was awesome. great because awesome. I was like, I'm so happy that, I mean, it like, I can fall with my clothes and stay on the ground until 7 a.m. And I'm going to be super happy because I did what I wanted. You know, I, I mean, I wanted to show everyone what I believe. And I wanted to show everyone like my view of what I think it's awesome and amazing on DFI. And, and I had that chance. So it, it was great. I mean, I was extremely lucky to have, you know, Jennifer Nix and Greg Piazza as the, as, the, as the program, you know, like the program chairs because they deal with the program aspect. Yeah. Like a lot of the sessions, I concentrated more on the, keynote part and they took care of all the other stuff with the amazing session shares that we have we did an amazing job so it was a great experience uh, I, I ended up making a lot of great friends uh meeting some people that i didn't know getting even closer and more personal with legends and and it's funny because it goes back into what we were saying i i, I feel that i have idealized the legends and the giants in our industry for such a long time that when you know them you know, and they're like happy to meet you. Like, oh no, man, you are meeting me, but I know everything about you. <laughs> I, I always say like, awesome. Lori Simpson, you know, Lori Simpson from Langan with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was similar. I, I think I met her in, in a DFI event. I think she got a room that was close to my room on the hotel. So mm -hmm. we ended up taking the elevator going, you know, down together. Uh, and she looked at me and obviously she's an extremely nice person. She said, hi, how are you? <laughs> you know, Sebastian, she kind of read, Sebastian, how are you? Yeah. Uh, and then I say, Laurie, how are you? I know everything about you. And then, like, <laughs> you should see the look that she gave me. She was like, oh my God, I'm on the elevator with this creepy guy. <laughs> and his room is next to my room. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. I mean, it's not on the creepy side. I mean, also the same thing since my wife worked for many years at Langan. Mm -hmm. I also said, you know, I, I mean, my, my wife was a, you know, project manager at Langan. So she went to like the manager meetings that you guys have, like yeah. in White Plains and, and all that stuff. So. She knew a lot of you guys, but I never really got to, to meet you, you know, or meet her or something like that. So uh, I, I think I still have that image in the industry that I come across as the super geotech fan that <laughs> is close to be creepy. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, that's a, that's a good note to pause on, man. We're going we're gonna to come back in just a minute and close this one out with Sebastian and our career factor safety in segment. Stick around. <laughs> All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety in segment. In geotechnical engineering, like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Sebastian Lobo Guerrero, PhD, PE. Sebastian, you've been at this for more than 18 years. Exp you know, you have experience as a geotechnical engineer. And if you look back at your career, what's one thing that you implemented into your career to give yourself, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? I would say, Jared, it has to be simplicity. I, I always say I'm a simple, I'm a simple guy with simple things, and I like to have a simple world. And I think I know it doesn't sound exactly safety, but it is. When you simplify your problems, when you go back to basics, you know, to statics and physics and soil mechanics, you can take a very complicated problem, make it very simple, mm. put extra safety and, and sleep well at night. I always, I, I take a, a sentence from one of my mentors, which is Rick Deschamps, right now with Nicholson, but, you know, he has at, at Purdue at some time. Uh, he always said he designs from gods. And I honestly leave that, design from gods. I mean, make sure that anything that you do, 
It's so simple that you have all the key variables, you can control them, and you fill on your guts that is safe. That's what you need. When you are doing advanced numerical modeling and you think you have many layers and all that stuff and you don't feel that good and it may not be that safe, it's probably not that safe. You always need to go back to simple. Simple is great. We live in a simple world. That's why we are geotech and not structural engineers. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sebastian, thank you for coming on the show and thank you for sharing such great insights with us. You shared some great information and advice that I know is going to help our listeners. I know it's helped me. But the last question I have for you is where can the listeners find you? Your social media, email, what can you share for contact info? Yes, absolutely. So the easiest one is to find me on LinkedIn. So just, just look my name and I'll be there. And I tend to communicate with a lot of people there. Uh, also, my email is Sebastian L. So my name and the letter L, the first letter of my last name, at Ages Inc. Just send me an email. Uh, I also use Facebook a lot for geotech stuff. So you can also find me there. And yeah, I'll be happy to connect. I even have a website for all the pictures and all my adventures on geotech. But you know, I can pass you that later on once we once we connect. But thank you very much for the invitation. And as I said, I mean, if anyone has any questions or just want to talk about geotech, I'm your guy. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the episode for today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 14, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during today's episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.